Monroe, the father of modernism, came to Chicago in 1938. Mies became director of the Illinois Institute of Technology here and would start spreading the modern or minimalist gospel around the globe. Now we'll see Mies' work later on. Right now, a new wave of architecture is coming out of Chicago from a young woman, Jeannie Gang. Her first skyscraper is the Aqua Building, right to the left of that crane where the Coast Building is under construction. It's the building with the shimmering glass and the wraparound balconies. It was inspired in part by the limestone outcroppings around Lake Michigan, but also it's a good ex uh, example of what Lewis Sullivan was talking about when he said form follows function. Well, the function of Jeannie's building was to give everyone of those condo and hotel rooms a unique view of Chicago. So look closely at the form, the wraparound balconies, you'll find they're specific to each floor. For the best view possible, Jeannie and her assistants took a model of that building and a laser pointer, and they kind of worked from the outside in. In other words, first they'd think of a view, like Millennium Park downtown. Then they came back to the building and they looked through the windows. If they couldn't see what they wanted to see, they leaned right, they leaned left, they stuck their head out. And when they got a sight line, they said, let's put a balcony here. Let's put a balcony here. Let's put one over here. Form follows function. Now coming up on our right is a beautiful Vermont granite fountain. This is Centennial Fountain, 1989. It was designed by Mies van Dros grandson architect Dirk Lohan to commemorate the 100th anniversary of a very important Chicago group, the Chicago Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, responsible for one of the seven engineering wonders of the United States, reversing the current of the Chicago River. Chicago. The name of the river is coming from the Native American Chicagua, or Place of Stinking Onions. 1673, Father Marquette and Louis Joliet arrived here exploring for friends, looked at the river, thought, too much mud, let's go home, until the river guide, a 10-year-old Native American boy, shows them a shortcut. At the end of the south branch of the river, there's a portage. You could carry your canoe reaching the southern flowing Des Plaines River, which flows into the Illinois River, and that flows into the Mississippi, meaning Chicago could become the critical link in an inland canal system connecting the entire continental United States. The 1848 Illinois Mission Canal made Chicago a boom town, but we're a city that went to work too young. We grew up too fast. A million people and being hog butchered to the world, all the meat packing plants use the river as a sewer. That polluted the lake, our drinking water. 12% of Chicago died, typhoid, cholera epidemics. So to stop the river from polluting the lake, in 1900 they dig a new canal, parallel to the first, but now they get smart the second time around. The Sanitary and Ship Canal of Chicago was dug deeper than the Chicago River off the South Branch. And using gravity as an aid, and actually a few pumps up here just to get the momentum going, they caused the Chicago River to start flowing backwards away from the lake. That saved our drinking water Lake Michigan, and we sent the pollution south to St. Louis, Missouri instead. And that's how the river still travels today. If you're actually from, from St. Louis, apologies for that. Now coming up on the right is a very intriguing building with a mosque-like onion skin dome. That is the Hotel Intercontinental on Michigan Avenue. It's somewhat esoteric and eastern design. Actually came about in 1930 when it was first built. It was the Medina Athletic Club. It was a project of the philanthropic group, the Shriners, who sometimes trace their history to the Freemasons and Knights Templar hints at esoteric design. Back in the 30s, they were going to use that as a Zeppelin landing pad. That never really happened. You know, dirigibles kind of fell out of favor. Look on your right as well in the distance with the antenna. The fourth tallest building in Chicago, a modernist work of art. That's Big John, the John Hancock Center. 1,127 feet, 100 stories. That was modernism. The equitable insurance building, glass box on the right. This is modern architecture as well. Highly articulated structure, attention to detail, but never any decoration. The modernists coming out of the Bauhaus were about pure form. To a modernist, decoration on a building, man, that would be bourgeois, superfluous, dishonest. They got rid of it altogether. Now, friends, London has Big Ben, Paris at Eiffel Tower. Chicago's answer coming up on the right, the clock tower of the one and only Wrigley Building, commissioned by chewing gum king William Wrigley Jr., who as a young man attended Burnham's Fair, never forgot that Beaux-Arts style, brought it downtown. Spanish Renaissance being the influence for the clock tower modeled after the Parola Tower in Spain. On your right as well, like a Gothic Cathedral, Tribune Tower, home to the Chicago Tribune newspaper. 1922, Colonel McCormick of the Trib offered up $100,000 a worldwide design contest. Howells and Hood in New York won, inspired by the Gothic Cathedrals of France and Belgium. Now speaking of France, we often refer to our Grand Boulevard, Michigan Avenue, as Boule Miche. It was inspired by the Grand Boulevards of Paris. We have named the bridge Du Sable Bridge to honor the founder of Chicago, Jean-Baptiste Pont Du Sable. A French-speaking fur trader from Haiti became our first permanent resident in 1779 at the site of the Tribune Tower. He built a fur trading empire. Ah, the new second tallest building in Chicago is the blue monolith with spire on a right Trump International Hotel and Tower, Adrian Smith Architect. 
Yes, New York financier and um, fading television star Donald Trump <laughs> blesses us, if you will, with a 92-story, 1,125-foot building. Now, wait a minute. It's two feet shorter than the Hancock Center, but it's listed as taller. How'd they get away with that? It's actually the spire on the roof. The Council on Tall Buildings in the Urban Habitat. Not a Monty Python comedy sketch, but a real non-profit that awards the tallest buildings. They say spires should count as height, so when you add the spire in, the building jumps up to 1,369 feet. But let's return to the Beaux-Arts tradition. Coming up on our left, the silhouette of the cloudy sky behind it is the Jewelers Building of 1926. Actually, this building was inspired by a 15th century Italian monastery, the Sotosa de Pavia, but it was built here for the diamond trade. Back in 26, you could drive your Model T right into the basement from Lower Wacker Drive, state-of-the-art auto elevator lifted your car, retrieve your diamonds, run through the building like a happy squirrel. You felt really, really safe. Well, safety was an issue. It was prohibition. Alcohol was illegal, but let's get it straight. The city of Chicago has never been dry. You could get a drink during Prohibition right below that dome at the Stratosphere Lounge where the bootlegger Al Capone used to hang out. And on our right, this flat box is Mies van der Rohe, father of modernism's final American commission, the former IBM building. Mies known for saying less is more. You see why modernism is called minimalism. You take away the decoration, you strip the building down to skeleton, skin, space. That's it. Skeleton, your frame, skin, your glass curtain wall. Space, more often than not, we find is square. Unless maybe you're the rebel modernist, Bertram Goldberg, never did like squares. Hence the curvilinear design of his Marina City Towers, earning their nickname in 1967, the Corn Cop Towers. Fans of the band Wilco will recognize him from the CD cover of Yankee Hotel Foxtrot. Now right here, you're looking at the student rejecting the teacher. Bertrand Goldberg had studied with Mies van der Rohe, but he felt boxes, psychological slums, a circle would kind of gather people together. Notice that's a complete city, docking for boats, four restaurants, a bowling alley, a swimming pool, a bank, office space, and your living space upstairs. You see, Goldberg was working at the height of the 60s when the middle class kept leaving the city for the suburbs. He was kind of trying to reverse that trend, because without a strong middle class living right in the heart of it, friends, you will never ever have a great city. And Bertrand Goldberg realized a lot of people wanted to live right downtown, where the action was 24-hour urban living, but they needed uh, everything at home because the river didn't have a lot of extra amenities, so he put everything at your fingertips. On a right now, the Western Hotel actually began as the Japanese Nico Hotel, elements of the beautiful roof garden remaining. And the glass box above the Bridge House Tavern on the right, the Heinz Building, is a good example of international style. This comes to us from Skidmore, Owings & Merrill, Bruce Graham, Architect, 1987. In a nutshell, the international school modernists were kind of of the viewpoint, forget about architecture's history, we will start from zero. Hey, we have the glass box. Now we can put the same building, a glass and steel box up anywhere around the globe. And then we'll just keep repeating that over and over and over again. Step back to 1913, friends. The red brick building with clock tower on our right is the Reed Murdoch Center by George Niemans. Niemans actually associated with the Prairie School of Architecture. Prairie School architects evoke our flat Midwestern landscape. Their designs are rising hugging, balanced here by the clock tower. You will note the building is asymmetrical. It misses a fifth arch bay on the left-hand side. You see that bay had to go out when the bridge you're approaching came in. 1926, they're widening the South Street to put the bridge across the river. Now the Reed Murdoch Center, which had already been there for 13 years, it comes out too far. Did they change their plans?